Hello, my name is Stan Copeland and I'm the pastor here at Lover's Lane United Methodist Church. And I want you to know how pleased we are that you are worshiping with us today through our live stream. This is a very exciting time. We've been live streaming for seven months now. And we're going to be in our different worship venues in person. But we're also going to be live streaming because we realize that there are many of you who are worshiping with us from across the Metroplex and throughout the country, even throughout the world. And let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, all you have to do is go on the chat, and we'd love to know where you're coming to us from. So again, thanks for being with us in worship. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christina Victoria. Um, I am excited um, for this morning for worship, um, especially because of our music. Uh, this morning, uh, Christine and Victoria will lead us in worship um, with Latin style music. I am so excited as we participate this morning in worship. Good morning. Um, my name is Andy Nelms, and uh, I have the privilege of being the teaching pastor here at Walnut Hill Church, and I want to welcome you to worship. We are so excited to get to worship with you this morning. Um, I just want to bring up a couple of things. Um, if you would, go ahead and let us know that you are here. However you're worshiping with us, uh, click below and, and, and let us know. You can either um, comment on Facebook. You can um, click your attendance there on the website. And either way, we would love to know that we are worshiping with you and want to celebrate that alongside you. 
Um, also, I want to let you know about a couple of things that are happening in the life of the church. Um, today is actually the first day that we are moving to in-person worship. Obviously, we have moved our worship time now to 11 a.m., and um, at this very moment, we are actually having a um, drive-in worship in the East parking lot here on our campus at Walnut Hill Church. And so, I um, hope that you'll make plans for the next week, whatever you are comfortable with, however you want to worship. Uh, want to celebrate that. And so we do want to let you know that we are having drive-in worship um, starting today uh, at 11 a.m. in the East parking lot. And then also something fun that's happening today, um, at 4 p.m., our um, family ministry team is hosting worship in the park, our park worship. Um, we had one uh, yesterday, and we're having one today at 4 p.m., so at 4 in the afternoon at North Haven Park. And so if you would like to participate participate in that. You are welcome, everyone from 2 to 92. It's going to be a great time of worship. I will be there helping lead the word, and so i um, excited to get to worship with you in that way. It is a great day to get to worship God, and we are so excited that we get to worship with you. Uh, invite the kids on forward now, wherever you are, if you want to gather around the, the, the TV or the computer, um, for Miss Emily Fry and our kids moment. Will you join me now as we join together in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Now let's join Miss Emily Fry for our kids' moment. Hey! Hey! I'm looking at a photo album. Do you ever look at photo albums? Or scroll through pictures on a phone? This photo album I'm looking at today has pictures of when Mr. Jesse and I first got married. That's when we very first started our family together, just the two of us. And then if I look a little deeper into the photo album, I find pictures of when Molly was first born. And then our family grew from two to three. And then a few years later, if I look a little farther, I can find pictures of when Max was born. Like this one, take a look. This was when he was first born and he and Molly were together for one of the first times. It's really special to me. And then our family had four. But here's the way that our family has grown the most. Look at this picture. There's Molly and that's her baptism. Molly was baptized in a church in Missouri, which was my home church, and she was baptized there, with, surrounded by all of her family in a really special baptism. Let me show you Max's baptism. Look at this. There he is, right here in the shepherd's garden. Did you see it? Have you been in the shepherd's garden and seen the beautiful baptism pool? Well, Max didn't get into the pool. He was too little, but a lot of you probably have. If you were baptized there as an older kiddo, and a lot of our family members may have been baptized as adults. But Max, as a baby, they took the water and they sprinkled it on his head and they baptized him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And when Max was baptized into the family of God, his family grew a lot. Our family grew a lot. Because the family of God includes you, includes me, includes all of Lover's Lane, includes all of the believers who have gone back and back and back in time, and includes everyone who's to come as a believer of God. That family's pretty huge. Could you imagine getting everybody together in a picture? That'd be a challenge. But that's the amazing thing about the family of God. It has enough room for everyone. And when we're baptized, that water that is sprinkled on our heads or the water that we're put into and pulled back up symbolizes a new life. 
a new life with God, a new life to show that the grace of God is with us and that we are a part of God's family. And that's a pretty beautiful family to be a part of. Today we celebrate baptism and we're grateful for the family. Amen. Thank you, Christina Victoria. And um, it is a blessing to be here to worship with you this morning. Again, my name is Andy Nelms. And, um, you know, we are beginning a new sermon series um, this morning called Redeeming Ritual. Um, It's all about the practices that we have as Christians, the things that we do to remind us of God's presence. And you know, I, I was thinking about something the other day. When I was a kid, um, my parents, um, when I was about eight years old, my parents took me to a place called Kiowa Island in South Carolina. It was, 
you know, just a, a small little vacation place, and, and there was a, a house we stayed in that was right on the beach. It was an amazing trip, and something we did that was really fun is um, it was a house that we were staying in, so we went and got groceries and, you know, made all of our own food, and we went to the video rental store there in Kiwa. Of course, this was back when, you know, these video rental stores were still um, in operation, and, and so we went to a video rental store and rented videos for each night that we were on vacation, and it was so much fun to pick out these videos, and um, and then, you know, the last day of our trip, you know, as we were getting ready to fly home, we uh, drove by the video, video rental store and, and dropped off our videos, and, and then we flew home. Um, well, that was one of my favorite vacations. That was really just like one of my favorite things. And so anytime my parents would ask me, you know, where do you want to go? I would always mention this place. And so uh, four years later, we went back to the same house, to the same place, and the same island in South Carolina. And um, and, and I wanted to do all the same things. And so we went back to this video rental store. And when we got to the place, we realized that it had a completely different name. Um, it had been bought. Of course, this was four years later. And so we went through the same practice. We picked out the movies, you know, and, and I picked the ones that I wanted to watch each night of the trip. And, and, and we came up to the desk and we, um, and we laid the, the videos on the desk. And, and the person said, you know, can I have your phone number so I can look up your account? And I said, well, we've only been here one time, you know, th it was four years ago. And he says, well, let's try it anyways. And so she gave him, you know, their, our phone number and he punched it in and it came up and he said, oh, you owe a dollar and 38 cents. <laughs> four years later, after changing hands at this company, it was no longer even the same video rental store. They had kept track of this debt that we had caused at the store by turning in a video a day late. We owed a dollar and 38 cents. It reminds me that, you know, sometimes we are pretty good at holding grudges. Right? Have you realized this? That, that we are pretty good. You know, we may mock, we may make fun of, of you know, other people and other companies that kind of keep this kind of track, but we are pretty good at it ourselves. Have you ever noticed this? Maybe you're somebody who says, no, 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 not me. You know what? I, I forgive really quickly. I, I let go really quickly. I want to show you a picture here and, and ask you again, are you good at holding grudges, right? How do you feel about Odell Beckham Jr.? Um, and, and how do you feel about Baker Mayfield? You know, like, like uh, having a one in three season so far doesn't feel so good. Maybe we, we've held on to this grudge a little bit longer than we should. And the thing about grudges is, is that, that holding on to unforgiveness, holding on to a grudge, will lead to our death. It may not be a physical death. It may not mean that we may not stop breathing or that our hearts start beating, but even while we are living, we will die. You know, sometimes we, we, you know, we try to forgive. We just don't have the energy to do it. You know, we, we try to muster up all that we can to try to forgive this person. But honestly, sometimes we just give up. We, we just give up and, and we say that, you know, we've let it go. But honestly, a piece of us died whenever we tried to do that. We, we say that we've tried to forgive that person, but we've really just kind of stopped bringing it up. But there's still a piece of us within us that every time we think of it, there is this twinge. Or maybe we haven't even pretend to forgive. Maybe we are still holding on tight to this unforgiveness, this thing that was done to us long ago. We have held on tight. Our knuckles are white because we are gripping it so tightly. We have held on to unforgiveness and it is dragging us down, but we will keep it because we were wrong. There, there was not justice served. This thing that I am holding on to is so important, or at least I think it is. We are good at holding grudges. But sometimes we hold on too long. Henry Cloud and John Townsend in their book Boundaries say that holding a grudge against someone else, holding on to unforgiveness against someone else is like drinking poison yourself and hoping the other person dies. Right? The, it, holding on to this unforgiveness is, is, like, is like drinking this poison. We become bitter and we hope that it somehow affects the other person. We are good at holding grudges. 
Sometimes we have this unhealthy relationship with forgiveness. And that's why this morning it is so important to talk about redeeming rituals. That's why it's so important this morning to talk about baptism. Baptism. Um, we have a practice, a redeeming ritual as a part of the church known as baptism. Uh, we have our uh, baptismal basin here and um, we practice baptism with water. I don't know if you can see this or, or hear this, but this is a very important practice ritual in our church. And so sometimes churches have very ornate baptismal basins as this one is. Actually, um, I think Martha, Martha Jacobson sent me a picture of how this one was constructed uh, through glass blowing. It's a very um, beautiful, um, beautiful baptismal basin. I want to thank our altar guild for our, our beautiful decorations and representation of the water this morning. We have a ritual practice that we know of as baptism, and we use water because water is a key theme throughout the Bible. Moses, in the book of Exodus, as a baby, was placed in the water, in a basket, and sent down the river as his redemption was plucked up by Pharaoh's daughter. Israel, as they were being redeemed, as they were being brought out of Egypt, out of the hand of slavery, they were redeemed by walking through the Red Sea as the sea parted. They walked through on dry ground. This water represented their redemption. And while they're wandering in the desert, Moses strikes a rock with his staff. He strikes a rock with his staff, and out of the, the, as the rock splits, water comes flowing out of it. And of course, when we get to the New Testament, water continues to be a theme throughout the Bible. And as we get to the New Testament, Jesus himself is baptized by John in the Jordan River. And when Jesus comes out of the water, as his head comes up from the water, everyone around hears this voice. Here's the voice of God. The Spirit of the Lord descends like a dove and they hear the voice of God. This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to Him. With Him I am well pleased. Jesus then institutes a new kind of ritual that we call baptism. Jesus says, I'm instituting a new covenant with you, and it is represented by this water. It is represented by baptism. Um, we got to meet with our disciple group um, on Wednesday night, and during disciple, we talked about the difference between a contract and a covenant. I think it's important information for all of us to know that Jesus did not institute a contract with us. A contract is simply this, two equal parties entering an agreement. Right? That's what a contract is. That, that, uh, I was just speaking with Victoria this morning. You know, she and Ricky are getting ready to buy a house. They've entered into a contract with that. Right? That there are two equal parties. One is exchanging money and then another is exchanging a house. That there are two equal parties. If you've entered into a contract, you know this to be true. And that if you fail to hold up your end of the bargain, the contract can come back on you. And you can receive repercussions. You can receive all of these things that you might even be able to fall out of the contract. Never be able to get back into the original agreement again. But that's not what Jesus instituted in the baptismal waters. He did not institute a new contract. Jesus said, I have instituted a new covenant. A covenant is this is God's commitment of grace to God's creation. God's commitment of grace to God's creation. God created everything. Everything that is seen and unseen. God created everything. And God made a covenant with that creation. And said, I will continue to be graceful to you. I have this favor for you, even though you did not earn it. Even though you did nothing to earn it, I will continue to have favor for you, to pour out my grace upon you. I will continue to do this thing for you. No matter what we do, we may choose to respond in different ways. We may choose to, to respond to God in different ways, but God will still hold up God's end of the covenant. That's what grace is. And so we represent this covenant through the baptismal waters, and, and baptism does a few different things. Baptism symbolizes our reception of Christ as our Savior. If you have been baptized, you have been asked if you would receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord. 
then that's what we've agreed to in the baptismal commitment, or maybe that was agreed to on your behalf. Through the baptism of waters, we are incorporated into the church. We are incorporated into the body of Christ. We are, are made one in the body of Christ through the baptismal waters. Through the baptismal waters, we learn about forgiveness. We, we learn about forgiveness in Jesus Christ. God has forgiven us. And when we truly learn about that kind of forgiveness that we receive through Jesus, only then can we begin to forgive others. You see, there are, there are important words that we can use in any relationship we have, whether it's with God or with others. Uh, there are six words. The first three are this. I am sorry. The three most important words that we could ever use in a, in a relationship, I am sorry. It, it takes incredible strength and power to apologize. And in a sense, when we are saying, I am sorry, we are saying the mirage of being right. The mirage of being right is no longer more important than our relationship. This, 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 my way is not the only way. I am sorry. My way is not the only way. I give up pretending that I am blameless. I give up pretending that, that I am in any way without blame in this relationship. I am sorry. It takes incredible strength and power to do that thing. So I am sorry, part of the six most important words we can say in any um, relationship. The third are just as important. The other six are, I forgive you. I forgive you. When somebody apologizes to you, it's important to be able to say these words, I forgive you. Then, right? Not to say whatever. <laughs> Not to say don't worry about it. But to say, I forgive you. I forgive you in a sense you are saying, although there may be new boundaries now in this relationship. Right? You may have wronged me and, and there may be new kind of barriers that we put up to protect ourselves. But although there may be new boundaries in our relationship, this won't come back. This won't come up in conversation. I won't use this opportunity to make myself superior to you. When somebody comes to you and apologizes, there is incredible power differential in this relationship. They have apologized, and, and maybe you've been in relationships where you've apologized to somebody and they've used that apology back at you, right? They've used that apology, in, in a sense, to, to display power over you. But when we say, I forgive you, we say that we are not using this power. I am not superior to you in any way. I let go of my pretense of power. In a sense, I forgive you. I let go of my pretense of power in order to restore our relationship. This is the most important thing that we can say or do in any relationship, especially in our relationship with God. Through the baptismal waters, we have in a sense said, I am sorry to God. I am sorry for the sins I have committed. I am sorry for the times that I have not done your will, where I have disobeyed your law, where I have failed to be obedient. I am sorry. And God, through his covenant, has said, I forgive you. Again and again. And we will fail. The thing is, is that even though we are baptized, we, as much as we try to be more like Christ, we will fail again and again. And every time, God says, I forgive you because of the covenant that he has established with us. So here's the thing. If we are forgiven if we who are baptized are a forgiven people, how do we share that forgiveness with each other, our neighbors, and the world? So we read about baptism in 
Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. We call it 1 Corinthians. It's the first letter we have of, of this letter. And so uh, we read about baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. We read these words that, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all are members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all to, made to drink of one spirit. Paul says through baptism we are made members of the body of Christ. And we all become one just like your hand and your foot are part of your one body. Paul says that we are, now that we are baptized, we are all a part of that body. And forgiveness has a key role to play in this. Right? That we have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. But if we are going to be one body, then we need to be able to forgive each other. We need to be able to say, I'm sorry to each other. Because we are all now part of the one body. Friends, this is incredibly important. Because loved people love people. Right? People who are loved, people who have received the love of God, those people love people. Transformed people transform people. People who are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ and their baptism as they are made to look more like Jesus, they in turn naturally do that for other people. And forgiven people forgive people. If we have been restored into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then we also ought to restore our relationships with others. So I want to encourage you to do a couple of things this week, friends. I'm going to encourage you to receive forgiveness through baptism. If you have never been baptized, right? In the Methodist tradition, we, we only baptize once because we believe that God is upholding God's covenant. If you have never received the sacrament of baptism, I would invite you to consider receiving forgiveness through baptism. Experience the grace of God in this way. And, and if you want to talk more about that, the pastors are here. You can contact the church. We would love to speak to you more about that. But if you have been baptized, I would invite you to remember your baptism. Remember your baptism through apologizing to and forgiving someone else. Through the sacrament of baptism, through the water of baptism, we have been forgiven. Not because we deserved it, but because Christ died for us. And if you want to truly remember your baptism, sometimes we have uh, parts of worship where we will sprinkle and we will flick water on each other and we will say, remember your baptism. We will, we will remember in the water. We will touch it to our forehead. We will remember the fact that we have been baptized. And friends, I want to encourage you this week, since, since we can't throw water through the screen, I want to encourage you to remember your baptism. By apologizing. Going to that person. As we've been talking about forgiveness, you've been thinking about this person. You said, I really need to apologize to them. I really need to say, I am sorry. Or maybe remember your baptism by forgiving another person. Maybe they've said, I am sorry, and you just couldn't let it go. Or friends, maybe they haven't. And you still need to forgive them, not for their sake, but for yours. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Beloved, let us go to God in prayer as people who have been baptized in Christ. O God of one body in Christ, O God of one Holy Spirit, O oh God, in whom the many are made baptized into one body. We, your baptized ones of every race, color, place, and language, give you thanks and praise for the making of us to care for one another, to honor one another, and to need one another. But let us be honest with you, Lord. We confess to you our 
deep division of opinion in this season of deciding political leaders. We confess to you our sharpness of inflamed passions roiled by fear and social media algorithms. We confess to you our infection of pride and ego turning us hurtful to our neighbors. Oh Lord, we are spiritually and physically sick and we need to drink from your spirit of redeeming love. Forgive us our sin and those sins against your body and your creation. O oh God of Paul, compose and reorder our thoughts and action with yours. Let us succumb not to the ego flawed appeal of positive thinking, but appeal to us the power of your son love. Reorder our disordered body of mutual respect in Christ. Remember our dismembered body of good news and lead us to Christ-like thinking that knocks down our flawed perception and bias of neighbor. And let us treat one another honorably and in so doing, discover your care for all. God send us your hope-filled, ex-contentious Christians to contend against the evils that harm your body and creation and deliver us into one belonging body of respect and transform our sufferings into rejoicing. For this we pray without division, the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
now and moving our time as we consider the investment we are making in the ministry of the church. Uh, last week, we had Commitment Sunday, um, where we celebrated our commitments and investments that we will make in the ministry of the church in 2021. I want to celebrate that today we have received 46 commitments from 46 families. And so thank you so much to each of you who have um, already committed and invested your um, resources in the ministry of the church. Um, if you have not yet, there is still time to do that. Um, if you received a commitment card in the mail, you can mail that in, fill that out and mail it in, or you can um, submit your commitment online um, at whumc.com slash this is what we do. I want to let you know next week we are going to celebrate the grand total of the um, amount of resources that we are investing in the ministry of the church, and I hope that you will be counted in that. Um, and so again, I want to say thank you to the 46 families that have already done so and look forward to celebrating the grand total with you next week. Um, if you have made a pledge already or if you are a member of this church, we hope that you will continue to invest in the ministry of the church today. Um, you can do that in a few different ways. Um, you can um, give online by giving to whumc.com slash give. Uh, it's a safe and secure way to do and it's very simple and easy um, if you choose, or you can still write a check and you can mail it in. The address is here below. There are people here to receive that. I want to say thank you for your generosity, for your continued giving. We have been able to sustain the ministries of the church. I want to say thank you for your continued gifts as we continue to do ministry in 2021. Amen. I invite you now to receive this benediction, this blessing as we go forth into the world, whatever that means for you. I invite you to receive forgiveness through baptism. May you be cleansed of your sins. And may you remember your baptism. May you remember your baptism through apologizing to and forgiving others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.